Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let's get started. Um, in case you came here, please, um, um, let's, let's start. Uh, in case you haven't been here on Monday, just a quick introduction. My name is Anna Marasovic. I use she, her pronouns. I'm your NLP instructor. I also research NLP. I focus on large language models and work on stuff uh, such as interpretability and AI-assisted decision-making, uh, communication, and creativity. Uh, this course has two TAs, uh, Fateme and uh, Purbe. They are over here. And um, I told everyone on Monday to read syllabus uh, really carefully. I hope by now you have uh, done that. Uh, if not, uh, once again, please read the syllabus uh, very carefully. Uh, we have a set office hours that's new. They're listed here. They're listed on the website and on in the syllabus. Uh, there is one option every single day of the week. I did take into account when majority of you could attend office hours and understand there still might be um, uh, some of you who can't attend any of these because you have uh, other conflicts. If you are in that situation, uh, please reach out to us. We are happy to make appointments, but reach out a couple of days in advance to uh, be able to accommodate you in our uh, schedules. Uh, the first office hours are going to be held tomorrow uh, on Thursday. Uh, a few of you all have asked me about the necessary machine learning, deep learning background, because I did say that the course will be easier for those who have already taken these uh, courses. Uh, that said, I didn't. I think it didn't came across uh, uh, that I will give you all the background you need to solve the assignment. It's not like I expect you to know something to solve the assignment that will not be covered in the lectures. The lectures will include everything you need to know. The only issue, the only challenge I envision you might face is that the pace is going to be quite fast in the beginning. So some things I want you to consider is whether you are taking other depending classes, if you are in this situation where you didn't take uh, machine learning or deep learning before, uh, how quickly do you typical code? Uh, typically code, do you think this three weeks period will be sufficient for you? Uh, how much time do you need to usu usually to grasp new concepts? If you need a lot of time, which is fine, uh, have in mind that this is gonna be fast paced course. Uh, you should be comfortable with taking uh, derivatives with matrix vector notation and calculations, basics of probability, mean, and so on. These are the things I will just quickly glance over. And uh, consider also why are you taking this course? I noticed that people who don't have, who haven't taken formally machine learning, but are quite passionate to learn about uh, NLP and large language models succeed in this course because uh, they're just eager to learn and prioritize uh, this course. If you take this course only to meet certain requirements, you haven't taken machine learning before, you take demanding courses at the same time, uh, this might be challenging. In any case, talk to your undergraduate and graduate advisors who will uh, also know your situation better because uh, you might have special circumstances that uh, I am unaware of and I cannot uh, give you formally advice about. Um, and I did share in the announcement, I believe yesterday, uh, feedback I received from students in the spring who uh, I asked if you didn't take machine learning or deep learning, what was your experience in this course? And uh, if you read that, I think you can see that the, it's quite mixed. Some people say, okay, this was hard, but I liked it. Or some people say it was quite challenging. And my implied sentiment is that it, it wasn't the best situation. So I recommend that you read that to get some inspiration from your peers because you are probably better at reading uh, between the lines uh, uh, in, in a uh, student feedback. And um, my plan is to cover everything you need for the first assignment in this lecture if we have enough time, uh, which means that you can work on the first assignment immediately after this lecture. All right, so with all of that said, I want to go into our uh, first uh, technical uh, lecture. And the goal for today uh, is to learn components of a supervised machine learning system applied for binary text classification. Uh, these are the topics we are going to cover today, hopefully, uh, starting with components of a supervised machine learning system for classification in general. I will use the example of sentiment classification as my running example. Sentiment classification is the task where you are given some piece of text 
Usually in NLP, that's going to be text from movie reviews or other, other kinds of uh, reviews, such as product reviews. Here we have a movie review from IMDb, and the goal is to predict the sentiment. Sentiment is uh, a vague concept, and you can define it in uh, many, many ways, from very crude to very fine grain. And here we take a very broad view of sentiment, where it is only positive or negative. And the task is to, given this text, to predict whether this is a positive or negative movie review. And we are going to see what do we need in terms of a machine learning component to tackle something like this today. The first thing you need is uh, to represent your text in a numerical form. Uh, maybe because I just mentioned we, you need to know matrix vector calculations, you could uh, imagine that we are going to end up doing some kind of matrix vector computations, which hints that our, uh, we won't be working with strings directly. Text, most reasonable data structure to think about when you think text is to put it as a string in Python, but that's going to be insufficient for the purposes of machine learning. So the goal will be to give a piece of text to transform it in a numerical form, and that form will going to be a vector, a high dimensional vector of, of many, many dimensions. So that's the first thing we need uh, when we have a supervised machine learning for binary classification. The next thing we need is to make a decision about this text that we now have transformed into a vector. So we need some kind of classification functions that uh, decides which class to apply an instance. So this is uh, a mathematical way of writing what I just said. We are looking for a decision y hat that decides what to label a given instance uh, is, uh, a given um, piece of text x width. And here in uh, this lecture, we also want this decision to be based on probability. So we want the probabilistic classifier, meaning we want to make a decision based on the probability that instance belong to a certain class rather than um, making decision without having probabilistic notion, which would be possible too. So that's the next thing. We have our text, we transform it to a vector, we take that vector and using some kind of function, we get the probability that that vector, which corresponds to a piece of text, belongs to a certain class. Then, once we have all of that, uh, we want to find um, parameters uh, that define that function. So, actually, let me use uh, uh, this uh, example that I prepared over here. Here we have a simple problem. We have two data blobs, one corresponding to a positive class over here, and another which corresponds to a negative class. And we want to learn, let's say here, the problem is linearly separable, meaning that the linear line can separate the, these two blobs. So we know that we can assume that the solution to our problem could be a linear model that we can draw a line and say on one side of this line, this is where our positive examples are gonna be. And on the other side of this line, this is where our negative examples are gonna be. That's a valid assumption for this problem. The issue is we have made an assumption that this is a linear model, but we do not necessarily know which linear model exactly is going to be good. For example, this is also a linear line, but it's terrible, right? If we take a decision that the uh, all the instances above this line are positive, we are going to make many errors. I counted that at least 17 of these data points will be misclassified. And then we have almost good, but not perfect, which you see over here, where we do have very few errors, but still some errors. Each of these lines is uh, written in a very small font. Uh, here we have y equals minus one uh, x plus nine. And here we have uh, y equals uh, 0.8 x plus four. 0.8 and four, or in this case, minus one and nine, exciting, are our parameters. They define the slope of the line and the height of the line, right? We do not know a priori which those parameters are, and the goal of supervised machine learning is to find those parameters. So 
The third component you need uh, is to define a function you want to optimize for, and you optimize for by finding optimal model weights or parameters for that function with the goal to learn a model that then separates instances as well. Now, having said that, um, can you tell me um, what you imagine could be useful here? It's a, it's a, I don't expect you to know this, but I'm just interested to see whether you have intuition. I think it's kind of written on the slide, so let's <laughs> ignore it. Or maybe let's go here. In other words, I'm asking you, how would you change the slope and the uh, height where the position of your line, uh, what would be the good target for changing those weights to achieve? What would be a good thing to, or wanted thing to achieve here? Yes, please. That's right. For example, we can try to make them basically evenly uh, kind of afar from two classes. That's right. And um, that that's right. But I'm looking for maybe what will then that achieve? So that could be one min uh, optimization function. So now I'm looking for another idea where I'm looking for... Um, what would happen if you achieve this? Yes. Exactly. That's that's kind of what I have in mind. But what of these answers are good and kind of shows that there isn't like one optimization function. But the easiest thing to do here is to require that the number of errors we have uh, is as small as possible or minimal, which would be in this case zero, which is case which is the case with uh, this. Uh, uh, first plot over here. And now what you suggested would be even better because we see here that we, yes, we, in our training data, we managed to separate them, but now if we get new instances, they might occur a little bit closer to this line. And if we had something that's more evenly uh, afar from these two blobs, we would get better solution. So two things we learned here is that there are many ways you can define an, an objective function. There isn't like one that is solving uh, every classification problem and just that one. Uh, and another thing we'll have uh, learned here is that we often uh, try to minimize the error we are making on our data points when we have our solution uh, making decisions. Um, okay, so here, when we are using the notion of error, that means that we knew what the correct or true label for that example was. We have used that information. And this information had to come from somewhere. Where this information comes is from human annotators, people who we hire to look at these, let's say, movie reviews and label them as positive or negative. So when we use label data, that's when we are talking about supervised machine learning, which is in contrast to unsupervised machine learning, where you do not use human label uh, data. Okay, so that's, a, that's, a, that's a, now our objective function, our third component. Just to recap, we had turning our string input uh, into a vector, taking that vector and making a decision by measuring a notion of how likely that instance is belonging to a certain class. Now that we have that decision, we can, uh, given label data, uh, introduce notion of an error because we can tell the model's decision, the model's guess were either good or bad. And we want to minimize that error and we want to change our parameters, think about linear models, tweak it, change the slope, change the position to have the least possible error. And the remaining thing that, uh, the only uh, remaining thing is how do we actually tweak? We are not gonna manually try to, you know, change the slope, change the position. Uh, we are gonna use an algorithm that's gonna do that for, for us. 
And in machine learning, uh, sometimes, but very rarely, we have formulas for, in, uh, for identifying optima. So, you know, in high school, you learn about quadratic equation and then quadratic form that solves the quadratic equation. We'll never have equations that are telling us what parameters A and B in the case of a linear model are. Instead, we are going to use numerical methods. Numerical methods are iterative uh, methods, methods that iteratively, that start from some random A's and B's, from random parameters, and then iteratively change them such that the function we care about for us minimizing the error is uh, is uh, happening. So this was a little bit convoluted. So let me let me tell it again. With iterative methods, we start with random parameters in the case of a linear model A and B. We tweak those parameters a little bit in a particular way, and that particular way is such to minimize the error on the training data. Okay, so these are our four components. And when we talk about my supervised machine learning, we also have two phases, training phase and the testing phase. In a training phase, we use the label training data sets to make decisions. And then based on the uh, how good or bad those decisions are, uh, determined by uh, a function of our choosing, we change the model parameters and weights to minimize that error. During the testing phase, we are done with changing the model parameters. We say they are, for example, frozen. They stay as they are. And then we use uh, the model with those parameters and get decision for a held out test set. Held out means that these instances were not used during training. That's the most important rule of machine learning. Never use your test instances as your training instances, because then you are unable to tell that your model generalizes to unseen instances, which is the whole point of doing machine learning. Here is just some, if you're not familiar with these notations, I'm going to use these kinds of brackets to denote a set. Uh, and I'm going to use this notation to shorten uh, writing you know, each uh, element uh, of a set when, they, when I'm having just and instances of them. Uh, superscripts in uh, over the instances are going to in refer to the individual examples. So it example, for example, uh, this denotes a pair of an input, a movie review, and a label, sentiment label, positive or negative. Okay, so with this, uh, I have covered what are the four components of a supervised machine learning system. And now we are going to go into um, providing more concrete examples of each uh, one of these. Are there any questions so far? Okay. All right. As I said, we just covered the components. Uh, now we are going to go into uh, concrete uh, examples of uh, these components. And first one is going to be feature representation of the input. So going from uh, um, an input, which is just a, a text uh, or a string, however you like to think about it, and turning into high dimensional uh, vector. Uh, Already last lecture, I said uh, that the first step to being able to do this is, the, is tokenization, meaning splitting your text into a sequence of tokens, where tokens are those basic units which uh, we don't need to decompose into um, in a, a smaller units. We are going to have, uh, I believe, next week a whole lecture on tokenization. It's a it's a, a complex topic. Uh, but for now, to be able to show you some examples of feature vectors, we are going to talk about uh, white space tokenizer and consider it uh, in the uh, in the excuse me today's lecture. White space uh, tokenizer, as you can imagine, takes a piece uh, of text like the film is interesting as an uh, experiment, but tells no cogent story. Uh, so white space tokenizer is going to split. Uh, this uh, string into a sequence of words, usually, uh, by just stripping um, 
splitting uh, the string where the white space occurs. Could you tell me what the issue is here that you see right away? Yeah. Um, no, this is commas are here irrelevant. I'm just using them to separate like an elements of the list. Yeah. There's a period at the end of the story. Exactly. So ideally period would be its own separate thing, right? Um, we don't, we don't need it attached to the story. And there are many failures of white space uh, uh, tokenizers, such as conjunctions, are gonna be uh, are not gonna be split in this uh, manner. So this is gonna be a single word where it's not a single word. Um, hyphenated phrases are not gonna be split by hyphen, and uh, as we have just seen, punctuation it's not gonna be separated from the actual words. And so very rarely we use just the white space tokenizers today. It's actually something we call pre-tokenization before we do actual tokenization into those tokens. If you remember last lecture, they have those weird things like hashtags uh, before them. Uh, but for now, for today, let's just uh, consider white space uh, tokenizer. Uh, you can also, before you start turning your words or tokens here into numeric num numerical format, uh, you can also decide to do some extra pre-processing steps. And in a classic NLP, these would be common things like uh, lemmatization, determining that two words have the same root despite their surface differences. So sang, sung, and sings are forms of sing. And maybe uh, it's not necessary to keep all of these special forms and you can keep just sing. And then for example, if you have a document that's uh, written about singing in present form and another document that's written in about singing in past uh, tense, uh, by uh, lemmatizing this text, you will notice the similarity between them. Otherwise you might uh, not be able to do that. Stemming is stripping suffixes from the end of the word. It has the similar idea as uh, lemmatization. So for example, sinks, you turn it into a sink to be able to uh, capture the lexical overlaps between uh, documents. Uh, sometimes you need to break uh, text into individual sentences. This is called sentence segmentation. Sometimes you want to remove the stop words. Stop words are these very common words uh, that are commonly used in, uh, in uh, let's say, English language, such as uh, a, the, is, are. Sometimes you don't want to care about this because, again, if you have very uh, simple approaches like lexical overlap, then this word might over-dominate. And then two documents might seem more similar than they are just because they share a lot of common uh, words. But these words are not usually what makes some text uh, special. And sometimes you want to lowercase such that if, I don't know, some uh, text is not consistent with lowercasing and the other is, is, again, if you are doing just pure strict matching, you would lose um, the information that uh, the word is actually the same and uh, one is just not uh, capitalized. These things become less important with large language models. These days we typically don't do any pre-processing or at least at most we do um, uh, casing. Uh, so other things are not important, but before you dwell into deep learning uh, and neural networks, for example, for your first assignment, you can also explore this pre-processing text, pre-processing of text. Okay. So now let's look into how given this um, tokenized text, which is potentially also pre-processed, we uh, develop a, a feature vector. And to make things a little bit more interactive, I'm gonna illustrate that on my iPad. Are there any questions so far? Feel free to interrupt me and ask questions. Yeah. Uh, it's even hard to think about examples since I don't work with these things, but um, maybe you want to analyze sentences individually and then have information about them individually and then aggregate the decisions uh, at the end. So for example, one uh, approach to sentence uh, sentiment classification could be that you uh, predict the sentiment of each sentence individually 
get the scores and then average them in, in the in the end. Um, yeah, I just want you to be familiar with the term segmentation. Is that the hand over there or no? Okay. Okay, so let's uh, look into the um, bag of words. Uh, let me give you some example. Uh, this is an amazing movie. Okay, so when we do sentence, uh, uh, when we do tokenization, as I said, each one of these will be individual token and we are gonna have a list. The first thing you will need to do uh, with your featureization is to define uh, a vocabulary. And vocabulary is just going to be a dictionary where your um, tokens, in this case words, are indexed. Excuse me. So imagine we had a collection of texts. Here we have just one. Uh, you would uh, tokenize all these texts, and then you will look at which uh, tokens appear in this collection and index them one by one. So here we have word this, and we are going to index it with zero. Then you have is, which we are going to index with one, and index two, amazing. Index is going to be three, and movie is going to be indexed with four. So first thing, defining your vocabulary. Nothing special, just um, all the tokens you have encountered will get an index. And you're not going to repeat the tokens. Uh, they are going to occur only once with a single index in the vocabulary. Again, I'm going to repeat. Here I have just a single document, which is a single sentence. If you had five documents, you would make a vocabulary from all five of them, not just from a single one. So vocabulary is shared among all of your instances. Now your feature vector will have, uh, it's gonna be a, a vector. Uh, I will denote it with X is gonna be your input string and F of X is going to be feature vector. Your feature vector will be of the size of your vocabulary. So I'm going to use this notation. V is going to be my vocab. Um, so the vector can have uh, real numbers uh, uh, as an element of the vector. And the size will be the size of the vocabulary. So here I'm using this notation for the uh, size of a, of a set. And in particular, dimensions in this uh, vector will uh, correspond to indices in the vocabulary. So we have one, two, three. So again, dimension is five because we have five tokens in the vocabulary. And each one of these dimensions is going to correspond to uh, the token, which is indexed with that dimension. So which tokens corresponds to dimension uh, uh, zero? Louder? This. This, right? And with dimension number, what's this one, two, three? Louder, amazing, amazing. Well, it's amazing, you know that. So now the question is, we know, we have learned. Define vocabulary, feature vector, same uh, size as the number of tokens in the vocabulary. Each dimension corresponds to the token with that index in the vocabulary. And the question that remains is, what are gonna be the values of this vector, of this vector? So the values, there are options, um, at least two options for what the values are gonna be. We can record the presence or absence of the word. 
uh, of the token in the vocab. Um, so here, um, it's a it's a bit uh, strange because we have constructed the uh, feature vocabulary from a single example. Um, so for a moment, imagine we have another. So this is going to be our sentence one. And I'm going to introduce uh, sentence two to be just um, amazing moving. Okay, so this is a tokenized uh, a sentence, amazing movie. Now tell me um, if we think, if we record presence of, or an absence of a token, uh, what would be the values uh, for amazing movie? So what would be value here for this? Yep. One, why one? We are talking about this sentence over here, this one here, then zero, yeah. So it's zero because token corresponding to mention um, zero is this here. And this does not occur in this sentence, therefore we record zero. What's gonna be the next value? Why are we so shy? Zero. Zero, yeah, thanks. Would you, uh, do you mind explaining why? Uh, it's not, it's uh, not uh, present? Is, is not, uh, in yeah, is, is corresponds to index one. It's not in the sec uh, sentence. Then um, uh, what's the next value? Zero. Zero. Next. And? Okay, great. Uh, more, more, um, more voices were heard. Now, another option here is to record the count. So imagine we had a sentence, amazing, amazing movie. Sometimes he's really happy with this movie, like I was with June too. Then here we would have uh, for amazing, which is corresponds to three, instead of one, we would write how many times it occurs and it would be two, okay? So the only thing that changes is that we record not just one or zero, but the actual number of times that token had occurred in that sentence. Okay, this is uh, our uh, bag of words representation. Um, we have seen that we need to introduce a vocabulary which we construct from a collection of documents. I have used one just because for simplicity of illustration, but uh, if you had three documents, you would uh, check all the tokens that occur in all three documents. Then the, uh, the vector size, the feature vector size will be of the size of your vocabulary. And we have seen that there is a connection between each dimension in the vocabulary, uh, excuse me, in the, each dimension in the feature vector and the vocabulary. And the value in each dimension can be either count or presence or absence. And there are probably other things you could be doing. This idea can be generalized to bag of so-called engrams. Engram is an important term in NLP. It's a sequence of N tokens. So going back to this example, this is an amazing movie. Let's say I care about two grams, which would mean I care about sequences, consecutive sequences of two tokens. Can someone tell me all the bigrams in this um, in this sentence, this is an amazing uh, movie. And please raise your hand, it's gonna get uh, loud if you all try to do it at the same time. Yeah, over there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So you see what we did there. We just took two words that occur one next to each other. This is, is an, an amazing, amazing uh, movie. If we would care about trigrams, then we would have this is an, is an amazing, an amazing movie. 
why would we care about bigrams? Um, also, notice that I don't say two grams. So this is because it's a, I don't know why exactly. We have unigrams, bigrams, trigrams, and then uh, besides four, four, four grams, five grams, and so on. Um, why would we care about this? Well, for example, um, if we have, um, this is not, not a good movie, like a double negation. Uh, it signals that it's actually something that we are slightly positive uh, about. Or uh, very good, if you capture very good, it signals that it's more positive than just good. Um, with uh, with taking bicrimes into account, we capture basically more uh, information, uh, but then we have basically less things in our vocabulary. And of course you can also combine unigrams uh, and uh, bigrams. Um, so yeah, there is just to, just to recap the, uh, the benefit of bigrams is that you capture more linguistic information uh, this compositionality that we mentioned uh, last time in the language, which can be useful to model sentiment properly. Uh, on the other hand, your vocabulary becomes smaller and uh, these bigrams can occur less. So you kind of lose shared information among instances, which makes it harder for your model to learn shared features that are indicative of positive or negative uh, sentiment. Um, is anything unclear with bigrams or engrams? Uh, and maybe I didn't say everything else stays the same, right? So you define your vocabulary to be uh, composed of bigrams, and uh, then you record again absence or presence of a certain bigram into in your uh, text. Okay. Um, final thing that you might have seen before is a TF-IDF uh, representation. Here, uh, it's a slightly more complex, but uh, nothing uh, uh, too complicated. So we have T denoting our token and D our, denoting our document, such as movie review. The goal is to find the representation of the uh, document, a vector. And again, each dimension in this vector is gonna to correspond to a token, just like it did with bag of words, right? With each dimension corresponded to a token in a vocabulary. Um, You're going to first measure term frequency. You're gonna count number of times the token occurs in the document. So if we had amazing occurring two times, you will record two. You are going to, in your collection of documents, so in a collection of movie reviews, you are going to measure how many time, in how many documents T occurs in. The reason why we measure this uh, is because we are actually going to take the inverse of document frequency. So if a word had occurred in just a single document, uh, this value is going to be very high because we'll have N over one if uh, the, where n is the number of documents, max number of documents. If we had a word which is super frequent, such as determiner uh, a, it might occur in every single one of these documents. And then we have n over n, which is one. In this way, we are giving a little bit of weight to the docu to terms that are special, that bear a lot of meaning, that are occurring in only few documents, and therefore are special for these documents, are they are special feature of these documents. So we are counting these two things, what I just said, inverse uh, document frequency, and we are multiplying it with the number of times uh, where a token occurs in a document, which is a feature we have seen before uh, that can be useful. And now we have TF-IDF value for every term, every token in every document. And the way to get the representation of a document is to just stack uh, the TF-IDF values of tokens in the order they appear, they are indexed with in the vocabulary. Another option. And next week or week after, I don't remember exactly, I think maybe week uh, September something, uh, we will introduce word embeddings that are going to be even more powerful feature representation. 
For now, we are introducing just these uh, feature uh, representation to get you started with these machine learning models. But then we are going to be coming back to some of these things and they are going to become more complex. Uh, and one thing that's going to be more complex is that we are going to have these uh, uh, dense vectors where uh, instead of having uh, these vectors where we have a lot of zeros because a lot of tokens do not actually appear uh, in documents, we are going to have shorter vectors that are going to always have some values and we are not going to be able to interpret those uh, values. But more about that, just, to, just so you know that this is the not the last time you are hearing about feature representation in this uh, course. Okay, any questions about any of that? Yes. Mm, that's a good question. Uh, I guess you would only uh, care about them if uh, you have um, engrams that are larger than just uh, words, right? Like two grams and more. Um, I don't actually know. Yeah, I will check this. Uh, I think uh, this is an implementation detail. I don't know what people typically are doing. And, you know, as a developer, all the power is to you. So you can do whatever you want anyway. Uh, but I don't know what's commonly uh, commonly done. I can check that. Yeah. So for step one, this part, we just needed the tokens. So all those tokens do have labels, right? We're just not using them yet. Uh, no, their tokens don't have a uh, label. So tokens are just a list of, let me find uh, one one such list. Um, oh, here, this is a tokenized text. So you just split text in a list of tokens. Uh, so here you have this film is interesting, you know, like each, it becomes a list of words basically, but we only label we have is information whether this is positive or negative, this whole sequence. And each cube gets a label that each word is in. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And this, uh, I think, word level annotations would be uh, probably overkill for, for like going all the down to the words, but people are, have looked into phrase level annotations and then try to combine. If you know that this phrase is positive and this other phrase is negative and they are um, syntactically combined, then you can make a decision of what their joint sentiment should be. But this is not the approach we would, you know, do today because uh, we will just give it a whole sequence and, you know, leave it to the neural network, which we'll see in a couple of lectures now. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, sure. You you could you know have a very high number for n, but then um, uh, what will happen is that your vocabulary is composed of these massive engrams that occur only in a one document or two, and then this becomes a very hard problem for machine learning because. It, we would say it's too sparse. You don't have enough examples to learn from. What the model needs to see is that very often certain tokens appear with certain labels. So if you see, if you have positive sentiment, what will happen with the Unigram model is that the word amazing, good, great, all of them will uh, appear in the feature vectors and as having a value and the label will be positive and then the model learns the connection. But if you have very large engrams, then you have basically one example uh, that this kind of engram is connected with that label and that becomes impossible for the model to learn. Yeah. Yep. They're effectively just mapping tokens to their like total label. Are there, I don't know, implications that become more complex or like you're starting out, for example, like through and all of these? Yeah, you are totally right. So uh, these kinds of feature representations don't capture nuances and they are just counting words. And this can be quite powerful for some tasks, uh, especially simple sentiment class where certain words are used very often to explicitly say something. But you are totally right. If you had um, a sarcastic, oh, this is great, it would not capture that. And, uh, and 
the only way to capture this um, would be to have more context and then more powerful models that we are going to learn later will understand to maybe, you know, I, I would I don't claim that sarcasm is slow. So, uh, but even for the current best LLMs, if you just write down without having any way of saying it, it can't get it. Yeah, and this brings us to the fact that some of these models are purely textual and that some phenomena are inherently multimodal. Yeah. Okay, let's move on. We have a lot to do today. Uh, yeah, I hope that the idea had landed that we have now went from, uh, let's say a movie review, we split it into a sequence of words, and then we uh, turn this list of words into a vector where this vector is the size of the uh, vocabulary and where each dimension correspond to whether that word had appeared in the document or not. Next thing we said we need is a classification function that decides which class to apply an instance. And I said, I want all of us to have a probabilistic notion here. I want a probabilistic classifier, which makes decision based on a probability. Which brings us to the sigmoid function. And before we introduce the sigmoid function, I want to talk about the geometry of a linear classifier. I'm sorry, this is so nasty looking and let me immediately fix it. All right. Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, never mind. Uh, ignore this little symbol that's floating here. Um, let me first explain what are you seeing here. You are again seeing a problem where we have two blobs, one corresponding to positive instances and another corresponding to negative instances. Uh, we are working in a two dimensional feature space. We have only two features, X1 and X2, totally made up. This is, there is no meaning behind uh, this. Uh, so first notation is that here we have features x1, x2, sorry, I have previously called this f of x over abusing the notation a little bit. And then we have a weight vector. With the linear models, your weight vectors, um, and again, weights in a linear, if you have a, a line here, we know that we can write this line as uh, using this uh, equation. So. Um, just think about what you already knew from high school, uh, basically parameters of your linear model or, uh, uh, are the weights I'm talking about here, and we are just putting them in a single vector. Important thing with uh, linear classifiers is that we assume that there is this uh, line, uh, line separating these two blobs that's defined through these uh, weights, W1, W2, W0. And uh, W1 and W2 are determining the, if we take the, uh, the vector, which is orthogonal to this line, this vector in a linear models is pointing to where the positive classes are. And the W0 is just uh, to, uh, determining the position relative to the origin. So first thing I want you to remember that weight vector when we ignore the W0, which we call bias term, is of the same size as your feature vector. And this is not just random, this is intentional because each one of these weights uh, is telling us how much the corresponding feature, so for W1, how much X1 is corresponding, uh, how much it um, contributes to, uh, to, the, to, the, to the model. Um, this is not okay. Sorry, guys. I don't know why this slide is so messed up. Okay. Uh, excuse me. Corresponding feature. Okay. So we have uh, the same number of weights and uh, features because each weight is uh, associated with the uh, feature. Uh, the weight vector is orthogonal to the line that we have that we that should separate these two uh, blobs. The weight vector should point to the to the positive class, 
And then the dot product between the feature and the uh, weight vector is positive for positive examples. Basically, this is true because we said that the weight vector is pointing to where the positive, um, uh, positive examples are. And then uh, just from the properties of dot products, uh, if you have um, a positive examples, then their dot product with a vector that's pointing toward positive examples is gonna be positive. If it's in the other direction, it's gonna be uh, negative. And then this bias term is controlling uh, the position of this line, this decision boundary uh, relative to the origin. Otherwise, if he had no bias term, it will always grow through the uh, origin. And this just determines the basically how high or low uh, the line is gonna be. Okay, so uh, one thing I'm gonna start introducing is folding in the bias term. So basically I'm gonna introduce this dummy uh, dimension here uh, at the beginning of the feature vector. And I will set this dummy dimension to be uh, of a value one. And then when I have my weight vector, I will also add to the beginning the bias term W0. All of this does is when I make a dot product between our weights vector and our feature vector, I get uh, the uh, combination, the linear combination together with the bias term, which is what I want. So that's all this uh, does. This is a slight notational tweak to be able to do these dot products between without caring for the bias term. Once we have done that, we basically have our general setup for binary linear classification. The decision is gonna be made on X, depending on whether the dot product between the feature representation of that example, F of X, with the weights vector is positive one means that the class is positive. So basically what this is saying is if the feature vector and the weights uh, vector, if their product product is positive, that means that the weight vector is uh, going in, is, because we, we assume that the weight vector is pointed to the direction of the positive example, that product is positive. Therefore this, we say, must be a positive example and we label it with one, otherwise we'd label it uh, with a zero. So everything comes from this notion that the weight vector is pointing to the positive class and this uh, property of the dot product that uh, if, uh, if we have a positive example and the weight vector is pointing toward positive examples, then their dot products are gonna be positive. Okay, so what is missing here relative to what I said before? Yes, yeah. algorithm for finding weights, that's true. Uh, that's definitely true, but even before that, for making a decision, what are you missing? You're picking in a discrete value. That's right, exactly. I was. I, I didn't expect you to say the probability, I didn't. Uh, I, I kept saying I want a probabilistic classifier, and here there is no notion of probability, right? The dot product can be from minus infinity to plus infinity. So where is my probability that should be constrained to which values? You should be shouting this. Zero to one. Zero to one. Yeah, so that's missing. And easy, easy uh, uh, or not easy, uh, a happy thing for us is that we can easily achieve this by using the sigmoid function. Now we came to that sigmoid function that I had mentioned before. Here I'm introducing sigmoid function as a mathematical object, regardless of everything I have said in this uh, lecture. So it's a function that takes some number that can be from minus infinity to plus infinity, so a real number, and it squashes it between zero and one. Uh, and this is the form of this function. It's just a formula of the sigmoid function, which achieves this uh, behavior that we have uh, a value squashed to zero to one. It's almost like a linear function. Uh, if you kind of imagine a line here, but not really. So 
when we have very small values, it's going to be close to zero. And when we have very high values, it's going to be close to one. When uh, for zero, we are going to have a uh, 0.5. Okay, so now we take this function and you tell me, uh, we have, just to remind you, okay, it's here. We have previously said we can make a decision by taking a dot product between weights and feature vector and seeing whether the dot product is positive. And if it is, we say it, this is gonna be a positive example. And then we said, mm, great, everything's great, except that we missed the notion of probability. Now I told you, okay, there is this sigmoid function that squashes value between zero and one. How could we use it? How could we introduce it in our problem? Yep. Perfect, perfect. You are on the right track. The only thing is missing, uh, what do we give to the sigmoid? What's the input to the sigmoid? Oh, someone said it. The dot product, right. So we take, um, mm -hmm. okay, scary. Um, Okay, here, we take our dot products, which can be from minus to plus infinity, we squash them to be between uh, zero and one. If the dot product, the higher it is, more positive it is, and more we know that this example should be a positive example, right? So uh, here, the higher the dot product is, we have said previously, we would classify it as a positive example, with the sigmoid functions, this translates into giving a number one, which is perfect because that means that we have kind of a probabilistic notion here, right? The more sure we are that the example should be positive because the, the dot product is really high, we are going to give it a probability that's closer to one, which is the max probability we could. And other way around, if it's really small, the dot product, we are really sure that it's not a positive but negative example, we will give it a value zero, which in terms of the probability is great because that's the least probability we can give to something. This brings us to the logistic regression. So logistic regression defines the probability for binary classification, defines the probability of an example being positive. I use number one, for positive label by using uh, by applying sigmoid to the dot product between the weights vector and feature vector. And this is the general sigmoid function formula. Here, I just plugged instead of Z, we have the dot product. That's all I did. And then for the probability of the negative class, we know that because we have only two probabilistic outcomes, the probability of an other option is one minus being uh, a pro uh, probability of the uh, positive class, which is mi one minus sigmoid of the dot product, which then is uh, this uh, value over here. So in this way, we have just defined uh, the, the logistic regression. And I intentionally chose this as an example of a binary classifier because logistic regression is extremely important for other things we do in uh, machine learning, including neural networks which we'll see are basically uh, stacked logis logistic regressions. Okay, so we now we have our decision has changed. Uh, previously, we had that dot product should be uh, larger than zero. Now we change that the probability should be larger than 0.5. And this is basically equivalent. If your dot product is larger than zero, the sigmoid value of a zero is 0.5, then the, that directly means that everything for, for all positive dot products, the probability defined by sigmoid is gonna be larger than 0.5, which is uh, great. Okay, so this, this is it in terms of our classification model. Um, so we have defined this function to make decisions of whether an example is positive or uh, negative based on this probability, which itself is based on the weights vectors and feature vectors, okay? Yeah. Why do you want to do 
Are you asking why do we need weights? Yeah. Uh, without weights, you don't have a model. Your weights define the model. So uh, think about the most simple linear model, A uh, times X plus B. A and B determine the slope and the position. So why do you need weights? Is they need to they need to uh, they need to they need I did not say they need to be similar. I said they need to be pointing in the direction of the uh, positive numbers uh, positive uh, examples. The reason why we want that is just pure geometry. you have this line and you say everything above this line is going to be my predicted positive examples. And to transform that intuition into something mathematical is saying, well, if I define a vector that's orthogonal to that line, that vector needs to uh, be pointing toward the uh, positive examples. So just turning that intuition, one side of the line is positive into something which we can kind of mathematically work with. Okay, bear with me. You got this. We have turned our strings into features. We have defined our classification function by saying that we are going to assign positive label if the sigmoid of a dot product between weights and features are larger than 0.5. Now, what is missing? Uh, someone had already said this um, when I asked what's missing. So let's repeat it. What what do we miss in this whole thing? Yeah. The algorithm for what? For adjusting. for adjusting the weights. Perfect. So right now I'm kind of assuming we are having weights. We are just making that products. Everything is great, but we are actually not having any weights. So our next thing is uh, to find these weights. And the next two components of a supervised machine learning um, uh, system for binary text classification are about that. We are going to define an objective function that we want to optimize to learn these weights. And then we are going to introduce the actual algorithm that does that optimization. Okay, so first we are going into our objective function. This is gonna be short. We are going to have a training data set. And what we wanna do is maximize the likelihood of seeing the right, the true labels with our input examples. So here we have probability of a true human written label given an input example and the weights. Um, and likelihood for different training examples is defined as a product. I'm just gonna mention it, not gonna explain it. The product, because we assume these uh, examples come from the same identical distribution, and we also assume they are independent of each other. So if you take joint distribution of all of them, of all of these things seen, being seen together, you can break it down into pro the products of conditional uh, probabilities of a label given an input, but not care here we don't have, what is the label for another example? We don't need that. Okay, so we start with maximizing the likelihood. And then what we do in machine learning very often is when we have products of probabilities, we turn them, we apply logarithms and we uh, actually optimize for the sum of logarithms. It's easier to optimize sum than product. Important thing here is that we are trying to maximize this and then this is equivalent uh, we maximizing log probabilities uh, will give us same weights as uh, maximizing just pure probabilities. Can anyone tell me why? Would it be the same, uh, the same if I said we can maximize negative probabilities? Negative probability? Or quadratic of probabilities. What's so special about the logarithm that we can do this in terms of the maximization problem? Yes. Perfect. 
logarithm is monotonically increasing function. So uh, if we take uh, uh, the values, if whatever value was, um, you know, uh, the, the, the order basically of the values is not gonna change if we take the logarithm. So uh, finding uh, weights that maximize probabilities or that maximize log probabilities is not gonna change anything. Uh, unlike with, if I took minus of the probabilities where everything flips, right? Okay, and here uh, I'm gonna turn my maximization problem into a minimization problem by putting minus here. Okay, so basically maximum of log probabilities is the same as the minimum of negative log probabilities. That's, uh, I, I hope that's clear. This is, is basic math. And we are gonna define our loss function, the one we are optimizing using uh, this. So our loss is gonna be negative log probabilities. And what we are going to um, aim for by changing our parameters is to minimize the sum of negative log probabilities. So this is our objective. Any questions here? Yeah. Minimizing? Yeah. Um, okay. I'm, I'm going to try to illustrate this. Okay. So basically what I'm saying is that minimum minimizing f of x is equivalent. Okay, let me do this. Okay, I will simplify it. With respect to x is the same as maximizing f of x uh, with, okay, minimizing minus f of x is same as maximizing, uh, finding the maximum of uh, f of x. So let's take a quadratic function, for example, um, uh, not a quadratic is not a good one. Mm. Okay, maybe it's fine. Um, okay, if I have a quadratic function, f of x, right? Um, it's a bit strange because there isn't really a maximum, right? And then if I have minus uh, f of x, it's gonna be something like this, right? And then if I'm finding a minimum of minus f of x, I also don't have uh, uh, a, a minimum. So. I guess the better thing would be to flip this thing around. So here, here, minimum of this function. Oh, okay, sorry guys, oh, upside down. All right, I think this <laughs> shows it. So here, the, the minimum of this function is zero, right? And here the max of that function is zero. So basically maximizing uh, f of x and minimizing minus f of x are the same optimization problems. An easy way for me at least to think about is just if you flip these functions and then check what is the min and max. Hopefully that's a little bit clearer. Okay, so we have our we have our um, objective function, and the last thing to do is uh, do so is to actually introduce the algorithm that mini finds weights that minimize this function. So finding weights in our problem um, that are going to minimize the negative log probabilities. The algorithm we are going to use is this holy grail algorithm gradient descent. Gradient descent is used to find the minimum of a function. 
And uh, it's one of those iterative methods that I have mentioned before, which I will, usually we do this in high dimensions, but uh, for the sake of illustration, I will illustrate it here. So you have some function that looks like this. It's nice, it's convex, so we know that minimum exists. But uh, the gradient descent uh, does is it starts with some random, uh, random uh, point for a W. And we are looking for Ws that minimize the loss function. So we start somewhere over here. And then it's looking for the, um, the direction of this, uh, the, the steepest uh, uh, direction from that point. And mathematically, we know that that direction, the, the slope uh, at this point, is uh, given uh, by the derivative of that function in that point. This is where the gradients, which are extension of the derivative for higher dimensions, come from. And then if you take negative derivative, it points in the direction of the steepest descent. This is where descent comes from. So again, uh, we start with some random point. Uh, we check the uh, where is the, the direction of a steepest descent. The, Whatever we learned from about derivatives tells us that the derivatives gives us that slope. And if we take negative der derivative, they point towards uh, the bottom, positive with the uh, point uh, upward. And we want to move down because we are looking for a minimum. If we were looking for a maximum, we will take the positive derivatives. And then we say we are going to uh, move in that direction given certain step size that we determine. And step size is important. You want to take a small step downwards, down the steepest descent. If you take massive, uh, massive uh, step, what would happen is you would go down and then up. And then from that point, you would again go down and up. So you would start oscillating on uh, in, uh, in this particular loss function. So it's important to find the right step size and we call step size to be a hyperparameter. It's something that you as developers need to develop. And the way we try to do that is by trying different values and seeing how the model performs with different values. This is the actual algorithm. You are starting with some initial uh, parameters. Uh, for example, you can set them to zeros. When we talk about neural networks, we'll do something more clever. You choose a learning rate, for example, 0.1 or whatever. Then you define number of times you are going to uh, repeat this process that I will just introduce. Um, this can be three, five, 10, 100, depends on the problem. You're going to shuffle your training data. Randomness is important for our algorithms to be robust. Um, you then, for every training, excuse me, example, you can tweak the learning rate or not. You can fix it, but you can play around. This is something you will do in your assignment. So you can try tweaking the learning rate every time um, you do the next step. Next step is to compute the gradient of your loss function, the gradient of the negative log likelihood with respect to the weights. And then you update your weights by subtracting this uh, uh, gradient. So basically making that gradient descent, moving from your weights uh, in the direction of your gradient and the amount you move is determined by the step size alpha. Okay, is this clear? Mm, there are missing things uh, in terms of how to calculate gradients for the logistic regression, but is, the, is it clear how this algorithm works? This is very important. Okay, I'm taking silence as it is clear. So hopefully that motivates you to speak up if it's not. The thing we need uh, here, if we want to apply it to logistic regression, the only thing you don't know right now to actually implement this is what these gradients are. For this homework, we are going to, and now in this lecture, we are going to derive these gradients, uh, then we are going to uh, actually implement um, taking the step size with that gradient value. Later, when we start using PyTorch and neural networks, this will be handled for us using AutoGrad. 
Okay, but for now, I will give you formulas for um, for the uh, calculating gradients for logistic regression. So we are calculating the derivative of our loss function with respect to the weights. And our loss function, almost there, we are almost done. All we need for homework is to know what these gradients are. So as I said, we are go going to uh, take a derivative of the loss and the loss we have just defined to be negative log likelihood, right? And we know what these values for probabilities are because we define them. However, we they are different depending on whether the true label is positive or negative. So let's say that for a given training instance, the label is positive, the true label. Then we know that the probability we should be using is the one that we have defined for positive probabilities. And if you go a few slides back and you find what the probability for uh, y equals one is, it was this value over here. Now we are just going to do a few uh, mathematical operations. Uh, first one is that the logarithm of one over x is mi one minus logarithm of x. Uh, so just the property of a logarithm. And this, so this uh, minus cancels uh, with the other minus. And what was in a denominator just becomes the term we are taking the logarithm of. And now we are taking the derivatives. Logarithm of uh, derivative of a, a log x is one over x. So we have one over this term now becoming uh, the term in the denominator. And then this is a function that's composed of more things, right? So we are going to use chain rule. Uh, so when we take a uh, derivative of uh, something of this term, one plus a to something, e, um, e to something is um, uh, this, this becomes zero because derivative of a constant is going to be zero. Derivative of, uh, of uh, uh, e to something is going to be again, the same thing. And then uh, the last term that we have to derivative, take the derivative of is uh, the one that occurs here. Uh, we are taking the derivative with respect to w. So this is just, uh, uh, again, linear function. And uh, the constant is minus f of x, which uh, uh, is the term we have over here. Uh, now, uh, again, if you go a few slides back, you will see that if I put this to the, to the above the fraction line and whatever is below, that's our definition of the probability that y equals 0. That was the definition. So all I did is replace this term, these terms with a probability. And I want to stick with the probability that uh, this is a positive class because um, that's going to make implementation easier. We know that this is one minus probability of being positive. And if we kind of consider that we have a negative sign here, we can rearrange it to this. And this is our gradient for if the true label was positive. I'm not going to derive it, but you can do similar kinds of operations to get the value of uh, um, of the derivative uh, for examples that are labeled with a negative class. All of this is integrated in the gradient descent by just tweaking this line here, where we where when you are going to compute gradients you will need to have if condition. If your the true label is positive, you are going to use these gradients. And then if the label is negative, then you are gonna use this formula and everything else stays the same. Okay, this is it. Uh, I have a few slides here on accuracy and F1 scores that I will cover next time, but in the homework, you the goal is to achieve certain level of accuracy. So if it's confusing what the accuracy is, just just uh, check these slides, but I will cover them on Monday. First assignment here is released. I will, I will I need to set up the grade scope, but you have now everything you need to get started.